Hello and welcome to your Greek drama lesson. Today we'll be talking about the history of the Dionysia Festival, famous Greek plays and playwrights, and how they've influenced theater today. Stay tuned! First, let's talk about when the Greek period took place. The Greek period started in 600 BCE and lasted until about 200 BCE. From the beginning, Greek drama was presented exclusively at festivals honoring Dionysus, who was one of the many gods worshipped by the Greeks. Dionysus, the god in whose honor the plays were presented, was the god of wine and fertility. Wine was one of the principal products of Greece. His blessing was sought in order to ensure fertility of human beings and the land. There are many legends about the birth of Dionysus. He was supposedly the son of Zeus, considered the greatest of Greek gods, and Semele, the daughter of the king of Thebes. Zeus's wife, Hera, became jealous of the affair between her husband and Semele. Hera convinced Semele to beg Zeus to appear in front of her in all his power. Wanting to please his mistress, Zeus appeared in front of Semele accompanied by thunders. Semele's house caught fire and she died. Sorry. Before she died, she gave birth to the embryo Dionysus. Zeus called his brother and had him sew the embryo into Zeus's thigh until the day of his birth. Dionysus was killed, dismembered, resurrected, and made into a god. The myths associated with Dionysus were closely related to the life cycle, birth, growth, decay, death, and rebirth, and the various seasons, summer, fall, winter, and spring. By the 5th century BC, four festivals were held each year in Athens. Theatrical performances were offered at three of those festivals. The biggest festival was called Dionysia, and it was divided into two related festivals, Rural Dionysia, and the most important and popular one, City Dionysia. Both of them took place at different times of the year. First, we'll talk about the Rural Dionysia, also known as Less Dionysia. It was originally a rural festival in Eleuthera in Attica, held in the winter months. The purpose of this festival was to celebrate the cultivation of vines. During the festival, the people carried a phallus, that's a giant penis, and cakes, and revelers and singers were part of the procession. Greek playwright Aristophanes wrote a play about the festival called The Acarnians, which was one of only 11 surviving plays by Aristophanes. The play is notable for its absurd humor. <laughs> My favorite kind of humor. Now we'll discuss City Dionysia. The festival took place in Athens at the end of March and lasted several days. It was established during the tyranny of Pisistratus in the 6th century BC and soon became one of the biggest occasions of the year as a way to showcase Athenian wealth and power. The festival was second only to the Panathenae Games, also known as the Olympics. It was originally established to celebrate the end of winter and the harvesting of the year's crops, and it evolved into a religious and civic celebration with theatrical performances as offerings of the city to Dionysus. The plays were also expressions of civic pride and indicated cultural superiority of Athens over other Greek states. On the first day of the festival, the people marched to the theater of Dionysus carrying a wooden statue of the god and a large phallus made of wood or bronze. We couldn't find any old photos depicting this phallic procession, but here's a video from 2017 of people in Athens parading around a giant penis in honor of Dionysus. Yes, they still honor Dionysia to this day. On the second day of the festival, the playwrights announced the plays to be performed and judges were selected. The first performance of tragedy was by the actor and playwright Thespis in 534 BC. During the 5th century BC, three tragic dramatists competed at each city Dionysia. Each writer presented a group of four plays, three tragedies, and one satyr. A satyr play was short, comic, or satiric in tone and made fun of Greek myths using a chorus of satyrs. 
nine plays per festival were produced, totaling up to 900 plays by the end of the 5th century BC. Only 32 of them have survived though, all of them written by three dramatists, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. We know so little about the satyr play because only one complete example has survived, and that's the Cyclops by Euripides. The Cyclops is about a giant with one eye in the middle of his forehead. Let's talk about the playwright Aeschylus. Aeschylus is described as the father of tragedy. He expanded the number of characters in theater to two, allowing conflict among them. He started writing when theater had only just begun to evolve in Greece and made the role of the chorus far less important to the plot of the play, focusing more on the actors on the stage. Only seven out of the 70 to 90 of his plays have survived. His plays were written in verse with no violence performed on stage and have a strong moral and religious emphasis. Overall, he won 14 competitions and was sometimes defeated by Sophocles. Which brings us to our next playwright, Sophocles. Sophocles wrote about 120 plays in his lifetime, of which only seven have survived in complete form, the best known of which is Oedipus Rex. For almost 50 years, he was the most celebrated playwright in the dramatic competitions of City Dionysia. He competed in 30 of the festivals, won 18 of them, and was never judged lower than second place. Sophocles influenced the development of drama by adding a third actor, thus reducing the importance of the chorus even more. It wasn't until the death of Aeschylus in 456 BC that Sophocles became the most popular playwright in Athens. Sophocles was known for writing a lot of violence into his plays, but that violence did not translate into the performance. Instead, the chorus described the violence that was taking place off stage. For instance, in Oedipus Rex, when Oedipus finds out his wife is his mother, and he's the one who's killed his own father, he gashes his eyes out with his mother-slash-wife's brooch pins. Ouch. This brings us to our next playwright, the rebel Euripides. He wrote about 95 plays, of which 18 or 19 survived, more or less complete. His most popular work was Medea, written in 431 BC. He also wrote Electra, which was also very popular. His popularity grew as that of Aeschylus and Sophocles declined, which is why more of his plays survived than any of his contemporaries. Euripides created theatrical innovations that have greatly influenced drama of today. For example, he took traditional mythical heroes and gave them human qualities and then put them into extraordinary circumstances. He was also unique among the writers in ancient Athens for the sympathy he demonstrated toward all victims of society, particularly women. Yay, women! He was one of the leaders of intellectualism, together with philosopher Socrates. Both of them were made fun of by playwrights such as Aristophanes. Which brings us to our first comedic playwright, Aristophanes, also known as the father of comedy. Aristophanes wrote 40 plays, of which only 11 have survived complete. These plays are the only proof of an old style of Greek comedy called Old Comedy. Aristophanes was the most important playwright in old comedy. His plays were filled with pungent political satire and a lot of sexual innuendo. Aristophanes' most famous work was Lysistrata, which was about a group of women in an extraordinary mission to end a war by convincing all of the women in Greece to deny sex to all men. The dramatic structure of Lysistrata represents a shift from the conventions of old comedy. For example, in Lysistrata, he separates the chorus into old men and old women, which were really just men in masks because there were no women in Greek theater. Whereas in old comedy, it's just one big chorus. The last playwright we will discuss today is Menander. Menander was a Greek comic playwright best known for his work as a writer of new comedy. He is considered the father of the sitcom. He did away with the Greek chorus completely, 
He used aspects of daily life as inspiration for his plays, and they centered around ordinary people and not mythical gods. He wrote 108 comedies, of which only one survived in complete form, called Discalus, written in 317 BC. The play won the first place prize at the Lanayan Festival, which was another, less important theater festival. Unfortunately, we don't know if he ever won at City Dionysia. Always the bridesmaid, never the bride. Hmm. One characteristic of all Greek plays is that all the actors and chorus members wore masks. The use of masks in ancient Greek theater started with Thespis, the first actor and playwright. The 50-member chorus all wore masks which were similar to each other, but completely different than the leading actor's masks. All actors were men, making it necessary to use a mask to play female roles. Because Greek plays only used three actors, they had to change out their masks in order to play different characters. The masks were made of linen, wood, leather, or cork. Human or animal hair was also used. Some historians argue that the masks also helped the actors' voices to resonate further in the huge amphitheater that seated up to 15,000 people. Other historians argue that because of the way the masks were made, with very small eye holes that restricted the actors' vision, the actors' ears were often covered by hair instead of linen or wood, allowing the actors to orient and balance themselves. Although there is little theatrical information on Greek costumes due to the perishable materials that they were made of, we know what they might have looked like thanks to depictions on pottery and sculptures. The actors who played tragic roles would wear boots that elevated them above other actors. When playing female roles, male actors would wear an item called prosternata, which was basically a wooden bra. These costumes were a very important factor to theatrical plays as they would determine the character's gender and social status. We're now going to perform a short scene from Oedipus Rex, written by Sophocles. Oedipus Rex is about a king who murders his father and marries his mother, Jocasta. Our scene takes place right after Jocasta has just killed herself after finding out she is Oedipus' mother. Enjoy! <laughs> My tale is quickly told and quickly heard. Our sovereign lady queen, Jocasta's dead. Alas, Alas poor, poor queen, how, how came she by her death? death? By her own hand, and all the horror of it, not having seen, yet cannot comprehend. Nesles, as far as my poor memory serves, I will relate the unhappy lady's woe. When in her frenzy she had passed inside the vestibule, she hurried straight to win the bridal chamber, clutching at her hair with both her hands. And once within the room, she shut the doors behind her with a crash. Laius, she cried, and called her husband dead long, long ago. Her thought was of that child by him begot, the son by whom the sire was murdered, and the mother left to breed with her own seed, a monstrous progeny. Then she bewailed the marriage bed, whereupon, poor wretch, she had conceived a double brood, husband by husband, children by her child. What happened after that I cannot tell, nor how the end befell, for with a shriek burst upon us Oedipus. All eyes were fixed on Oedipus, as up and down he strode, nor could we mark her agony to the end, for stalking to and fro, a sword, he cried, where is the wife? No wife, the teeming womb that bore a double harvest, me and mine. And in his frenzy sounds supernal power. No mortal, surely none who watched him, 
guided his footsteps with a terrible shriek. As though one beckoned him, he crashed against the folding doors. And from their staples, forced the wrenched bolts and hurled himself within. Then we beheld the woman hanging there, a running noose entwined about her neck. But when he saw her, with a maddened roar, he loosed the cord. And when her wretched corpse lay stretched on earth, what followed, oh, twas dread. He tore the golden brooches that upheld her queenly robes, upraised them high, and smote full on his eyeballs, uttering words like these. No more shall ye behold such sights of woe. These I have suffered and myself have wrought. Henceforward, quenched in darkness, shall ye see those ye should ne'er have seen. Now blind to those whom, when I saw, I vainly yearn to know. Such was the burden of his moan, whereto not once but oft, he struck with his hand, uplift his eyes, and at each stroke, the ensanguined orbs bedewed his beard, not oozing drop by drop, but one black, gory downpour, thick as hail. Such evils, issuing from the double source, have whelmed them both confounding man and wife. Till now the storied fortune of this house was fortunate indeed. But from this day, woe, lamentation, ruin, death, disgrace, all ills that can be named, all, all are theirs. But, but hath he still no respite from, from his pain? pain? He cries, Unbar the doors and let all thieves behold the slayer of his sire, his mother's. That shameful word my lips may not repeat. He vows to fly, self-banished from the land, nor stay to bring upon his house the curse himself had uttered. But he has no strength nor one to guide him and his tortures more than man can suffer, as yourselves will see. For lo, the palace portals are unbarred, and soon ye shall behold a sight so sad that he who must abhor it would pity it. Ah, oh, me! Oh, woe is me! Oh, whether am I born, how like a ghost forlorn, my voice flits from me on the air, on, on the demon goads, the end, oh, where? An, An end, end to dread to tell, tell too dark, dark to see. Dark, dark. The horror of darkness like a shroud wraps me and bears me on through mists and cloud. On oh, me, on oh, me, what spasms of what me shoots, what pangs of agonizing memory. O oh, doer of dread deeds, how couldst thou mar thy vision thus? What demon goaded thee? Apollo, friend. Apollo, he it was, that brought these ills to pass. But the right hand that dealt the blow was mine, none other. How, how could I longer see when sight brought no delight? Alas, tis as thou sayest. Say, friends, can any look or voice or touch of love henceforth? My hearts rejoice. Haste, friends, no fond delay. Take the twice cursed away. Far from all ken, the man abhorred of gods, accursed of men. Oh, thy despair well suits thy desperate case. 
Would I had never looked upon thy face. My curse on him who e'er unrived. The waves fell fetters and my life revived. He meant me well, yet had he left me there, he had saved my friends and me a world of care. I too had wished it so. Then had I never come to shed my father's blood nor climbed on my mother's bed. The monstrous offspring of a womb defiled, co-mate of him who gendered me in child, was ever man before afflicted thus, like Oedipus. We hope you enjoyed that little scene from Oedipus Rex. Now to wrap up our little history lesson, we'd like to talk about how Greek theater has influenced the theater of today. The best playwrights, such as Shakespeare, George Bernard Shaw, and Moliere, all stole plot ideas from the Greeks and made it relevant to their time. Also, there are theaters today that still perform Greek plays that were written thousands of years ago. From the introduction of masks and audiences to the creation of both tragedy and comedy styles of plays, we can clearly see how every piece of theater we see today originated with the Greeks. Well, we hope you enjoyed this little Greek drama lesson. We'll leave you with a quote from Menander. Culture makes all men gentle. Bye! Bye.